Hello everyone, a warm welcome to Celebrating Weeds in Art, Science and the Everyday, part two. My name's Pete Yeo, I'm a reconciliation ecologist, a plant writer and nature mentor based uh, here in North Devon uh, in the UK, uh, as is the Resurgence Centre where we're beaming from uh, this evening. Uh, do please let us know where you're beaming in from uh, in, in the chat. It'd be nice, we had a, a nice kind of global audience uh, for last week's part one with Robin Harford. We will be recording um, this event. Uh, so if you do have to dash off and have to miss any of it, you can catch up. Um, and that recording will be with you and everyone who's uh, signed up for this event as soon as possible after the event. So without further ado, um, weeds, indeed many forms of planta non grata, are being reframed as our society shifts towards a more harmonious relationship with Gaia. Weeds are now rewilding our imaginations and regenerating our landscapes. They find themselves chalked on pavements, planted in show gardens, and once again, foraged for health. They support pollinators, revive degraded habitat, and offer climate resilience. This trinity of webinars will explore this emerging dynamic in conversation with leading liminal voices from the realms of art, science, and the everyday. As one person's weed becomes another's wisdom, will we soon witness the widespread flowering of planta conviva? So for our second convivium then, uh, we'll be gathering around artistic expression. And before I introduce our wonderful guest, Evgenia Emmets, um, I just want to set the tone with um, a short poem uh, or spell even from a wonderful book that was produced in 2017 called The Lost Words, which was a response to the loss of some very familiar words from uh, a well-known children's um, dictionary in this country here in the UK. Uh, words like bluebell, otter, wren, kingfisher, and uh, I think the book eventually became a, a campaign as well uh, around the, the loss of those words for our children. Uh, it was, the book was produced by author Robert McFarlane and illustrator Jackie Morris. And the extract I'd like to read, the spell I'd like to read is entitled Bramble. Bramble is on the march again, rolling and arching along the hedges into parks on the city edges. All streets are suddenly thick with briar, cars snarl fast, business over. Moths have come in their millions, drawn to the thorns, and the air flutters. Bramble has reached each house now, looped it in wire, people lock doors, close shutters. Little shoots steal through keyholes to leave in quiet halls, empty stairwells, Bowls of bright blackberries where the light falls. I think that's absolutely delightful and it kind of epitomizes my journey with weeds. What at first appears as threat becomes a gift. So without further ado, on we go. And I'd love to extend a warm welcome to Evgenia Emmets. She's an artist, a cultural creative and fellow vegetal advocate who's based in Portugal. She's also the founder of Eternal Forest. And I would encourage you to um, go to her bio uh, in the show notes and explore more of her work. She'll obviously be talking a little bit about uh, her work uh, a little bit later on. So Evgenia, welcome. Mm, thank you so much. It's um, nice, nice really, to see you really, again. Really, really happy to be here. And thank you so much for this beautiful introduction. Um, I think I have a very special relationship with brambles. There are many, many here in the forests of Portugal. And just before we start, I want to share something really quick uh, on kind of building on what you just said or growing on what you just said. Please do. I once went to the forest and I asked brambles, what's your purpose in the forest? Why are you here? And they said, we are here guarding the sacred heart of the forest. That was their answer. <laughs> so with this, I will start what I prepared for today. I just wanted to say I'm really grateful for this opportunity because I managed to connect and to get to know some really amazing artists whose work I'm going to share with you today. I am myself an artist, poet, founder of Eternal Forest, and uh, I live in Portugal, but I work 
um, across. Um, I work internationally, so. Okay, before you before you dive into your wonderful yes. presentation, I have to say because I previewed it and I'm very very excited about <laughs> it. I just want to, for the audience's sake, I just want to outline. Um, Evgenia will give her presentation and we'll have a little discussion, she and I, after that, if there's time. So that'll be about the first 45 minutes and then the second 45, it'll be open to the audience for, um, for questions to Evgenia Direct, which I shall relay. And um, just a couple of technical points. One, if you have any questions, if you can put them in the Q&A box, that'd be really appreciated, not in the chat. Um, there's also quite a lot of uh, useful links coming your way. And Mark, who's doing the tech behind the scenes, will be popping them in the chat. But please don't get distracted by that. The chat box will be wrapped into the recording passage so you can go, um, package so you can go and revisit those links at your leisure after the event. So, Evgenia, back to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I'm going to also at some point encourage you to use um, the chat, if I may, for one particular thing. It's a little surprise, but it's coming later. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So celebrating weeds, weeds in art. Well, before I start, I would love to share a poem. And the reason why I'm sharing this particular poem is because it's a poem about an, a plant that we internationally already used uh, to be calling invasive quite a lot. It's a poem um, that is written in the voice of Mimosa tree. I'm now developing a series of experiences in a place called Monsanto Forest Park, which one is one of the most beautiful parks next to Lisbon. It's been created by hand, by the hands of many people around 90 years ago. It's a man-made uh, forest. And it's already full of biodiversity and um, I'm developing a series of experiences and uh, two trails. And when I started working there about two years ago, I encountered this absolutely gorgeous tree. And when I came back this year to actually deliver my experience, the tree was not there anymore. It was just a completely empty lawn. Mm. And of course, we all know that Mimosa tree expresses these uh, qualities of propagating itself and propagating seeds really easily so it was removed by the forest services however the the poem remains and here it is it's called invisible notice me solitary above the ground below the ground the scars of me the time of mine the split trunk the writings on my bark the fluttering of my sensation the blossom is in springtime. Stand with me. Your scars, your split trunk, your roots stretching deep, holding that city, holding that past, holding your great grandchildren. Stand with me. So in my talk today, I will share with you the artists and their works who explore weeds, as we call them, unwanted plants, invasive plants, traveling plants, and displaced plants. The plants that grow spontaneously everywhere in urban and rural areas, whether native or non-native, we believe now that they're performing very important ecological functions, especially in the time of the climate crisis and loss of biodiversity. I chose specific artworks that contribute to rethinking the role of weeds and reframe our relationship with them. They create, these artists, they create artworks that are not only beautiful and aesthetical, but they, they set a whole way of new patterns, practices, experiences, relations, questions, and spaces where we can exercise this uh, very different and expanded relationship with plants. I do believe that these artists pose very important questions and they contribute to thinking about how we can regenerate and improve our urban areas, our um, rural areas and facilitate life supporting spaces. How we can create better resilience against climate change and loss of biodiversity, but also more importantly, how we can bridge uh, the disconnect between our comfortable, very comfortable life in cities and villages and nature's wilderness. 
And I would like to, you to invite you to consider the alternative routes and routes or routes to naming these plants spontaneous and following this route, come up with alternative names for these plants and some new titles. And perhaps while uh, tuning into this conversation, you can exercise the power of deep listening and with your creativity to already start putting down some new names and some new titles and perhaps share them later with us in the chat or as we go along and then later we can have a look together. And so how we can call these new plants in a way of reflecting their inventiveness, adaptivity, intelligence and resilience. And here I prepared a few really beautiful quotes for you. I'm sure you already <laughs> scan through them. What is a wheat? A plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered by Ralph Emerson. Weeds are flowers too once you get to know them by Milne. Such plants are weeds only to those who make a business of selling and applying chemicals. Ra Rachel Carson from Silent Spring. And the history of weeds is the history of man by Edgar Anderson. Uh, by Edgar Anderson, sorry, and all of them, I believe, are quite reflected quite deeply in the work of the artist that I prepared. And the first one, uh, which is, a, I believe, a very modest, beautiful image, um, it's a photograph, it's a silver, silver gelatin print from Harry Callahan, called Wheat Against the Sky, and I love um, this uh, image because it has this uh, kind of wabi-sabi style to it. it. There is no roots, it's broken at the top. It's kind of really imperfect, but it's very strong and it's very proud and it's standing these kind of lines against the white. I chose this artwork by Michael Landy, which is in fact a whole series of artworks. It's a very large portfolio and it's an edition and it's also in the Tate collection. Um, it's called, this one is called Creeping Buttercup. And I love it because I love the story that's connected to this specific creation. Um, so Michael Landy uh, created um, this series of etchings from the found plants on the streets of London after he basically destroyed his personal possessions. And it was a way for him to recover from this moment, to regenerate. And for him, these plants, they represent the spirit of survival. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, what he says is himself is they are marvelous, optimistic things that you find in inner London. They occupy an urban landscape which is very hostile, and they have to be adaptable and find little bits of soil to prosper. So, with a huge joy, I'm I'm sharing this artwork of Herman de Vries. Uh, I actually uh, already knew this artist before preparing for this talk, and I know his work exactly by this kind of collages. So, if you can imagine, this is a grid of framed artworks, which uh, the artwork is the actual arrangement with dried plants, and some of them are large and some of them are smaller scale. And um, they're really beautiful and fragile. And he collects these um, herbs um, where he lives and he arranges them against this white background. And um, uh, we're going to share his website with you. But the work that I uh, actually found out about as I was working on this presentation is this one. It's mm -hmm. called The First Sanctuary and it's created in 1993. Uh, in Stuttgart in a very busy road, as you can see in this intersection. And the idea here is what if we actually separated somehow space? So we partition the space and we, uh, then we would observe what nature does. So his idea here would be to protect a space from the intervention from the city, from the maintenance services that would come and clean everything down to the bottom and to see what happens. So this is a long-term project. It's still there. This is still the beginning of the project. For me, um, this project is really important to talk about because it's very much connected to the work that I'm doing with the Tunnel Forest. Although this is a small scale sanctuary, um, I, I think it's very interesting to see what actually can be done, or what nature can do. So here you, you see a whole congregation of 
uh, herbs, uh, bushes, uh, bigger trees already. This is more or less after 25 years. Um, I work much more on a larger scale with communities um, on scales like four hectares, 10 hectares, where you can actually enter the forest and have more immersive experience. However, it's interesting also to draw a link, uh, draw a connection between this artwork, which was done in 93, and um, the work of mini Miyawaki forests, for example, that are going everywhere in cities. And I know that in UK, for example, they are doing really well, and there are many, many places where you have Miyawaki forests already, so tiny forests as we call them. And um, of course there was a moment when it was destroyed uh, by the city, so this is uh, 2018 and um, they basically cleared everything, but it's still there and the forest is coming back, so the plants will grow back. Um, Candice Williams, so uh, we're going to share uh, her portfolio with you. Uh, what I would love to say about this artist is uh, I feel it's really, really interesting. Uh, she explores um, the link between botany plants and colonialism, and especially she is bringing into the image always the black body. And she is talking how she is seeing how uh, these narratives of colonialism and post colonialism can be transformed through her multidisciplinary approach. She works a lot with collage, photography, video, plant arrangement, and ultimately installation works. Uh, she uh, brings into the picture the migration of plants and the migration of people, and specifically during the time of slavery and post. Um, what is interesting about her work, I believe, is there is this parallel between unwanted plants and unwanted bodies. Um, and uh, some, somehow she puts bodies together with plants and especially with the native plants from these areas and somehow there is this spiritual connection with the power of plants connected with the body. Uh, herself, she says, I'm interested in how plants act as signifiers of our desires and as we lay the groundwork of our penal and corporal systems and for the genocidal conquests of lands and peoples. And here you have one of the examples of these collages. Here there's even a quote, I actually don't know where the quote is from, but to arise from the earth and be only a wheat question mark. Uh, one specific project from her that I wanted to share with you today is actually a video and I just let you watch it and then we can discuss it later if some questions arise. So when I started doing research at the Huntington, the first thing that struck me was, and I think the igniter of a lot of this research is, um, there's a file cabinet in front of the botanical garden uh, library, in front of the botanical library. It's just a file cabinet of all the plants that weren't successfully migrated and integrated into the Huntington. So there's um, you know over 100,000 plants that have been moved and um, attempted to cultivate here, but didn't seed or take root or weren't able to grow. Um, conversely, you know, there's thousands of species of plants that are around the Huntington and on the grounds that are um, native inv invasive species or that have traveled or migrated with other plants. Um, and that, you know, is also an unmarked or uncategorized or unmapped kind of like system in the garden. Um, so I think, yeah, my first, my first inclination when I got here and do, started doing research was, was that file cabinet. I think specifically because of how haptically visual that, that cabinet was as well. It was like, you know, those kind of old library cards with the plant's name and genus and its origin and then a dead stamp. And one of the collages is, is actually a collage of Henry Huntington sitting in, I think, in, there, in the gazebo for the Rose Garden. Um, and I've kind of collaged him into this Goya painting of Kronos eating Saturn. And um, yeah, just sort of thinking about this, this devouring of the natural world and this um, you know, regurgitation of it into ordered, you know, ordered squares, right? Like these squares that are also predestined sort of to be, to implode because they aren't phenomenologically natural. So um, another artist that uh, I've chosen for this sharing is Mona Karen. And um, 
Uh, her work is absolutely stunning. She works a lot around the world. She works with communities directly and with communities of plants as well. Um, what I love about her is that she always weaves the story of the community into her, into her work. Um, she really places herself in that space and uh, co-creates with people, I think also based a lot on the stories. Um, she tries to reflect on the re resilience of the plants, uh, the, usually the weedy plants, the kind of unwanted plants, but also the resilience of the community and that's the link there. I chose a few pictures to share that are from my, um, my family in Lisbon. Actually, I haven't seen them in person. They seem to be uh, very much placed in this um, kind of semi-destroyed, uh, dilapidated buildings. And I love how she calls them, it's phytography. Um, uh, so she says herself, over time, I got invited to contribute weeds at very symbolically perfect locations around the world at a larger scale. The pieces below integrate my long-standing social practice of direct street level spontaneous community participation in my murals, actively feeding the weeds metaphor at its root. Um, indeed, uh, there is a specific artwork and uh, several artworks where she weaves the images of the people walking or uh, the images of the people from the community into the root of the plant. And uh, once she created this route that actually you walk through it, you walk and you enter the building. So the whole plant grows through it and people can recognize themselves. So I'm going to share with you a short video of her artwork because it's really nice to see also this work in progress as it's being created. So I just love to see how beauty can also be and this kind of activist uh, step and stage for activism as well. Um, an artist that I've been following now for quite a bit is Christopher Kennedy. Uh, he's based in New York and uh, what attracted me first to his work is uh, his work with, um, with, with plants. Um, and only then I discovered also that he has this collaborative project called Environmental Performance Agency, which plays also with the, uh, with, with the same letters as Environmental Protection Agency. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about him. Uh, so Christopher, you see here on the image, this is the, the picture, I believe, of the whole team of uh, EPA. And so he's a designer and researcher who works with various organizations, companies he also teaches and he creates projects, uh, artistic projects, learning experiences with a focus of creating new knowledge uh, to, uh, to basically help people to cope with climate, um, climate chaos and also think about sustainability through creative action. 
Um, so together with the Environmental Performance Agency, they work with wild ecologies, urban landscapes, creating awareness through posters, interventions, research initiatives, and always engaging people to focus on this human-plant interaction and human-plant care. Um, so this is one of the performances of um, one of the members of EPA, Catherine, Catherine Grau. Um, um, the collective was founded in 2017, so it's been going now for a few years. And uh, it was named in response to the proposed defunding of the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so they, they always play, they not only play with these notions, but they actually directly engage. And I will show you how. So uh, for example, uh, we can see some of the posters that they created. This one is No War on Plants. And um, uh, not this not this poster, but another one also reads, and this is quite important that this lettering is there. We only have an estimated 50, 60 years of arable topsoil left, largely due to extractive monoculture systems and the cult of Eurocentric loan maintenance regimes that have no place at a time of extinction. Next time you think about grabbing a bottle of weed killer or see it at your local hardware store, take a moment to consider the agency of our more than human allies, even those we consider unwanted or pests. So they work a lot uh, creating this kind of posters and I believe it's quite effective approach. Uh, this is another silk screen poster, which also uh, plays with this um, quote from uh, poet Dinos uh, Cristiano Polos um, and his book from 78. Um, they tried to eradicate us, they didn't know we were weeds. <laughs> so this is one of their performances or one of their actions where people could contribute uh, directly you know, through a specific toolkit, uh, contribute their comments and desires and demands and then those were delivered on behalf of the weeds uh, to the US uh, EPA. Um, so uh, that's how they try to make this bridge between their, uh, their initiative and the actual organization as well and to engage uh, citizens directly. And so from here, we make a bridge to Ellie Irons, who is also, as you can see, this is EPA. Uh, they're all wearing this beautiful outfit, um, working with plants. So Christopher is here and Ellie as well. And um, I would love to share a couple of works from her. This one, because I believe it's also connected really well with Herman de Vries, earlier artwork that I shared, which was made on purpose. In this case, what Ellie is doing, she's only documenting what's already there. There's quite a few of these plots that she identifies in Brooklyn and other places. And she basically looks um, at the timeline she captures the moment when they are completely devastated and the, they're bulldozed um, and the moments when the green goes back. And when she describes the plants, we can see all the usual suspects. They are all the plants that are really resilient and really uh, take well in the soil that is highly disturbed. And sometimes she creates yet another cycle. So after the disturbance, she waits until the plants uh, regrow and then she goes and takes another image and she shares those. Um, so she calls them uh, feral, feral landscapes. And um, the project that um, I was drawn to to share with you today, I think it's very interesting. It's um, feral and invasive pigment. So what she does, she uses the um, harvesting sessions, usually with groups of people, and then she creates um, pigments and paints from plants, berries that she collects from invasive and feral plants. Um, usually she delivers art creation workshops. She likes to share this with people and then they do gardening experiments and during her, her own studio practice she creates maps, uh, guides, texts, uh, videos, and charts. And this is one of the examples. I get to have these more in-depth conversations about what it means to think about an ecosystem as pristine and not pristine, as made up of desirable natives versus undesirable invade, invaders, she says. I'm always trying to trouble that binary. 
And with her project uh, with the feral landscapes, she says, rather than focusing on concrete, trash and gum, the things you see when you look at the sidewalk, I was looking at the inverse of that, at the greenery. And here we have one of the examples of her workshops with people. So they are always this plant-centered learning experiences and of course, incredibly essential for the communities to, to understand what's growing around them. Also, she uh, really uh, makes a point to reclaim the word weedy and rewarding and reconsidering the different kind of words that we can use for what we call invasive, unwanted, alien and exotic. Um, Uriel Orlov is a really interesting artist who is based between Lisbon and London. Uh, he started, um, I think, primarily in London. He works internationally. Uh, his concerns uh, in his work um, mainly with residues of colonialism and he works with plants and uh, looks at how plants are political actors or how plants can be political actors. He, he brings the connection between plants and humans across colonial and post-colonial geographies. So he works across borders, creating the links of, let's imagine a plant, uh, he finds plants that traveled from somewhere and he really traces back uh, where it comes from. So this particular picture is from Soil Affinities in Paris. Uh, it's a really interesting project. He looked at um, Aubervilles, which used to be a place where gardeners grew food and supplied food to the local markets. And then with industrialization, they were asked to leave. So they took with them the soil, the plants, everything. And he keeps finding those uh, feral uh, wild plants um, that um, it's very strange how they got there. He also traces, um, and they're edible plants, of course, because they were growing for the market, they were um, cultivated. And uh, he traces this um, naturalist called Paul Jove walks uh, that he did and recorded 100 years ago. And he goes around and he kind of recalls that history and finds the same plants basically growing there, just more in a much more wild um, state. This is one of his installations called Theatrum Botanicum. It's very hard to describe his work because it's really multidisciplinary, it's all encompassing. Um, and it's also a continuous project. Um, it includes film, sound, photography, installation, and it really looks at botanical world as a kind of a place for politics. And in this particular case, he works uh, in, with dual points between South Africa and Europe and the project considers how plants are both witnesses to the history, to particular um, uh, moments in history, but also agents of this history. So in the last uh, few minutes that are left, uh, I will share a little bit about my work. Um, as I mentioned to you before, I primarily focus, especially since five years, since I'm living in Portugal on the project that I developed here called Eternal Forest, the reason I started this project is when I arrived to Portugal from UK, actually, after living 10 years in London, I discovered that the ecological situation here is quite devastating. The whole country is penetrated by vast eucalyptus plantations that are produced here for paper industry. And uh, Portugal is supplying the rest of Europe with bleached uh, paper. It's like wrapping paper, toilet paper, printing paper. And uh, this is quite a big economical program that was installed still in the time of dictatorship. So if you drive through Portugal, you will see uh, huge stretches of green, but this green is really green desert as we call it here. So as I'm working on creating and inspiring communities to create these protected forest sanctuaries that are of course uh, focused much more on regenerating forest to not to its primary state, but trying to encourage species that we lost, that we removed uh, because we wanted more production. I couldn't, uh, but I couldn't not notice the eucalyptus plant, which is everywhere. It's quite, um, uh, yes, basically everywhere you go, you see, you walk into monoculture. And um, I didn't want to touch this subject because it's quite a contentious and very different, difficult topic. It's, it's a tab, taboo here in Portugal as well. But what happened is the plant spoke to me. I basically went on one of my walks and I heard this voice 
that I need to work with eucalyptus plant, uh, which for me was quite a surprise. What I ask myself is how we can work with this plant in a, of course, sustainable, regenerative way, but also how we can uh, create a new alternative narrative, a story in which plant has its own voice. That was what was interesting for me. And my agreement with the plant was that the plant speaks through my work and I give it space. So I give it um, uh, my space and my work as an artist and the plant can find its own way. So I worked with plant very intuitively. I just used the materials that are available. They are on the ground. The plant sheds leaves and barks. It's a natural process. The plant um, circulates tannins in, in the system. So the tannins have to go to the root and then circulate back into the tree. And all this artwork is created because the plant has tannins. So I'm using botanical printing technique to extract tannin directly on the fabric and then the prints stay, stay in the fabric. So I'm, I'm working with leaves and with bark of the tree and I'm creating these imaginary landscapes or the imprints of the eucalyptus tree. Um, my hope is that with these uh, narratives, with this project, I can open the discussion, a more constructive discussion with people where the tree has a voice and has agency. While we were doing this project, uh, the first stage was developed together with Ines uh, Valle, who is a curator based here in Portugal, and the Sarah project. We also engaged specialists and biologists and anthropologists from uh, Australia. We had a serious conversations with Monica Gagliano, Philip Clark, and also a series of um, people who are based here in Portugal who actually research eucalyptus. One of the biggest concerns and questions is, is the tree invasive? And a lot of my, my own natural observations and conclusions is saying, no, it's not invasive, it's we made it invasive. We put it in such a way that the tree basically um, is just there. It regenerates after the fire, after cutting, but it doesn't propagate actually so easily as for example, acacia tree, which is quite a different story. So um, what I also wanted to share as a wrap up to this, <laughs> to this conversation, to this talk, uh, is the series of books. I discovered some of the books as I was preparing uh, for this talk, and some I already knew. Some of the artists that I mentioned are also mentioned in, in these books, and we also share with you all the links so you can go directly and buy or sometimes you can find pdf and i find these books on the subject very very helpful so i guess um, i am done with my sharing and i wanted to see if there is anybody who already shared some alternative names for the weedy and for the weedy plants and i'm super happy to give the word over to pete and let's hear from you Um, but first of all, brilliant. Thank you so much, Evgenia. That was a just really super inspiring to see the, the work of those artists around the world. Some of them, uh, well, I think Mona Caron was the only one I knew and I love, I love her work. But I, I've got some new favourites now from your presentation. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, before we kind of, I, I kind of put a couple of questions to you before we go to the Q&A. Um, one of the words that was... Uh, brought to my attention an alternative word for weeds uh, recently was volunteer, volunteers, which I rather like. Um, so you, I think you probably can access the chat so you can see if people are contributing alternative words. But I mean, one of the things that um, is kind of written through the whole presentation and what you've been, what you've been sharing um, I dug up a, or came across a lovely quote by Thomas Hubel, who's a um, collective trauma specialist um, based in Israel, I believe, at the moment. And he said, art can be a great tool to let the mute voice or voices that cannot so easily be ascribed by words and language be present in our various dialogues. And a quote from yourself uh, from elsewhere, um, about listening to all the beings on the land at any given piece of land and you reference that as you were going through and that also makes me think of 
and contemporary anthropologist Anna Singh, who speaks of the art of noticing, uh, and also Stephen Howard Buner, who got, got uh, several mentions last week uh, in last week's event. And his, the key question that he invites anyone um, to think of when they first engage with any kind of foreign or in so-called weed or invasive plant is like, what is it doing here? It's here for a reason. What is that? So it's that kind of deeper listening you were talking about. So I'd love you to kind of talk a little bit more about how artists can be, can unleash those, those voices that we would otherwise be deaf to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I really love what you said about uh, listening to all beings of the land. I think this is a practice that I believe is fundamental. Um, it's fundamental in my work, for sure, in the work of Eternal Forest. I'm trying to encourage all my collaborators, other artists and other types of collaborators, not necessarily artists, to learn it. I absolutely love the work of Stephen Berner and I know his books and I'm incredibly inspired by this work, but also work of many others. Um, those who um, know the techniques and ways and practices and methods of going out there on a plot of land in your garden, in your forest, and really opening up to and tuning in and seeing what comes back. I also think that um, the field of herbalism, for example, is shifting massively with this understanding that mm -hmm. it's not necessarily every plant is good for every person in the same way. We must go and ask the plant, what, what would you like to offer or what is good for me or what can I help you with is a, is a conversation. So uh, I do feel that uh, from my observations, artists are becoming much more in tune with these ideas and much more experimental. Um, and I do think that I do feel that this will come through in art. Um, because we, I think, I think we're really shifting in contemporary art from depicting plants in poetry as well, uh, from depicting plants or depicting places to actually giving them agency and giving them the voice. What happened to me about one and a half years ago, no, already two years ago, I was working in an art residency in Portugal in a very, very difficult place that is on the edge of desertification. And I was preparing to make a film, to interview people, but I also wanted the land to somehow speak. And um, when I went to this really beautiful place with the river and meditated there, the land said, well, I would like you to write your poetry from now on from the perspective of me, for in my voice, from the perspective of the land, the places, the mini ecosystems, the landmarks, the plants, the beings, and that was a huge turning point for me personally. And I'm seeing more and more of that around me when artists really um, kind of removing themselves as persons, as egos and giving much more space in their creations to, 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 to the plant beings uh, and not only to, to, to other kind of uh, being, because also we, we should not never forget that we cannot look at just plant as one thing. There is always a family there. And so that is the problem with monocultures and with any kinds of reduced ecosystems, because there is always a spectrum be between monoculture and the forest. When we start shifting things around and moving things and extracting and removing some parts of it, uh, we are losing a lot because the family is lost and plants, they cannot, it's a society, they cannot live just by themselves. Mm. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's fascinating kind of re-emergent um, field, isn't it? I mean, you know, for some people in the audience, it may seem strange that um, we're talking about plant beings and communicating with plants. But I mean, we have the extensive body of indigenous um, perspective on all of this now being backed up by increasing amounts of scientific research that give credence to the, the notion of communicating with plants and their intelligence and all you know we were very lucky to have Monica Galliano uh, be in conversation with resurgence earlier on this year in the spring and uh, you know she's one of the, the world's leading plant intelligence researchers and I know we, we both know her so uh, yeah it's great um, 
we're almost at Q and A. Is there anything uh, final you want to, you want to kind of just throw onto weave onto that before we open it up to the audience for Q and A? Yes, uh, I think that it's important also to to kind of stay with the moment that we cannot just suddenly jump and understand everything because. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we observe incredible complexity in nature and uh, we just take a small patch of land whether it's a field meadow forest a river for me um by the way i'm also shifting towards not drawing uh, separation between them so mm -hmm. i started feeling river is a forest and mountain is a river so i, I have some writing already on this topic because I do feel that, that it's another thing we always separating things and putting them in boxes. But I also think that we should not expect this drastic change. Suddenly we can hear plants and suddenly we understand everything. I think there is more openness that we are observing. I think there is more um, desire to understand and to hear and to listen deeply because it requires time and it requires deep listening. And also uh, it requires uh, people who already know something and they can teach others. So this requires a process of unlearning and then learning. And from my perspective, and this is what I'm working on a lot, it requires creating spaces where we can dream together with nature. And, and, and these spaces, we, we remove them. So because we parks, can be the spaces sometimes but not really we need wild spaces and we need spaces that are for that where we really protect biodiversity so we can go once in a while and dream in the spaces and understand better mm. yeah absolutely um you met your mention of spaces there um artists as well as kind of opening up the the, the channels of communication with such beings they can probably play a, a really important role in curating safe, non-polarized spaces to explore these vegetal relationships. Because it's it's increasingly my sense that, um, and I mentioned Thomas Herbal earlier, collective um, trauma expert. There's a if we dig down to the root of why people behave in, or react in certain ways to these these kinds of plant beings, um, these volunteer plants we are likely to find trauma, either individual or collective trauma, at the root of why they're behaving that way. So the creation of sp safe spaces, and artists are really, really good at this. That could be a really vital role in the future with, with, because of the flux of um, uh, in nature, the plant mi migrations due to climate change. That's going to be a really key role, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think that um, every time I hear about yet another problem with yet another invasive species, I straight away go and look what is the current status of the health of this ecosystem. And usually the ecosystem is in really poor health. And that's why these plants are there, be yeah. it rivers or forests or meadows or whatever we take. Um, and yes, I do agree with you that being aware of our collective trauma traumas because there are many there um, and one of them i can think of is a um, situation with burning of the witches and destroying mm. the wise knowledge uh, the wisdom of how we related how we knew the plants and this is a huge um it's it's it's, it's massive <laughs> yeah it, it, it came up last last uh, last week you know, it's one of the key colonizing tools is to kind of sever that root of indigenous knowledge um, to make it e to make the colonization process easier. Yeah, uh, there's a big rabbit hole there, but I mean, you certainly touched on that as we did last week, and it's a very important aspect um, of the decolonization narrative. Okay, thanks, Evgenia. We'll we'll go into Q and A, and there's some some questions already in there. First up from, and I'll take them in chronological order from Chris. Can you please give some more information or a link for the tiny forests, please? Uh, you mentioned it in connection with Herman de Vries, uh, but I didn't catch the name. I think I saw it with the, um, the uh, closed caption recording, struggled with the name, because I think it's a Japanese name, isn't it? Yes, so uh, these uh, forests were more or less developed by a person called Miyawaki in Japan. I can type it here afterwards. 
Um, basically, the idea of Miyawaki Forest, the reason why I connected with Herman de Vries is just because it looks very similar. It's a very small space. It's usually 500 square meters, I believe, or even smaller. And uh, it's a tiny forest, uh, usually set in urban environment. And the idea is they can serve hotspots for biodiversity because we are losing biodiversity. So the idea is that everywhere we can put this tiny forest without sacrificing a lot of space. And I just drew this parallel because it looks very similar. However, these are totally different things. And I, I actually think that at the moment when he created his installation, uh, his artwork, the tiny forests were not yet there, or they didn't mm. reach Europe at least. No, it was uh, the, the illustrations you used, it was dramatic, the, uh, what grew, and it reminded me, it's a slightly different context, but um, having seen in a number of settings like the Sinai Desert, what happens when you you fence off the landscape from grazers uh, like goats or, or sheep or whatever and how quickly, even in a desert scenario, uh, the vegetation and life springs back uh, into existence and that the, the images you showed from, from Stuttgart were particularly uh, potent, I think. Um, and, and it's interesting that it's still there and, and regrowing. Um, it'd be interesting to see if it becomes an accepted part of the um, the local authorities kind of uh, portfolio in time. Yeah, there is one very, very important project that is uh, on that scale, but a bit, a bit bigger by Alan Sonfist. And the project is in New York and uh, it was 10 years or more in the making. It's basically a very dense forest. So he conceived it as a forest that uh, you enjoy only from the outside and it's for the purpose of biodiversity. So I think we can find several such uh, landmarks and I think there will be more because more people are working on it. <laughs> and I, I know that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, that, <clears throat> that kind of segues into a, 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 another question I had um, about past iterations of of kind of artists working with uh, this same narrative and uh, a few examples that I dug up. One was a, a poem by 19th century um, English poet called John Clare um, and also the famous um, gardener and garden writer William Robinson also from the 19th century who was very influential in, in the kind of naturalistic, the very early forms of naturalistic uh, gardening and he, um, he, he he was known for talking up the splendid invasiveness of plants like Japanese knotweed, rhododendron, Himalayan balsam, giant hogweed, things like that because they were they were they are very dramatic plants and very beautiful in their own ways um, and one of your slides I think it was um, I think it was Ellie Irons and there was the the, the shot of, of, of the street uh, in Brooklyn, uh, kind of before and after, if you like, or in between uh, clearances. Um, but there was a there was a, a, a vibrant tree uh, behind the chain, chain link fence, and it looked very much to me like it was tree of heaven. Yes, which, I think it which is. goes to to yeah the the another a different kind of artistic expression writing to to Betty Smith's novel from from 1943, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which was featured the tree of heaven or tree of hell or stink tree or ghetto palm and the various names and then you know it kind of picks up on the, the language and how we kind of perceive uh, these plants but yeah the 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 tree of heaven Ilanthus altissima in its in its um, scientific name was a kind of she saw it as a, a a totem for the resilient a totem of resilience for the disadvantaged communities that then existed in Brooklyn um, possibly still do for all I know um, but more than that, the tree we now realize has this amazing ability to um, cleanse the air and the soil of these disturbed, polluted urban environments in which it thrives, not just survives. And interestingly, and correspondingly in traditional Chinese medicine, and it's from China, it can be used and is used to cleanse the sludges of our own bodies in our guts and in our lungs as well, you know. Also, you know, asthma, bronchitis, diarrhea, dysentery. Um, it's a very potent medicine for for earth and well, the kind of inner and outer ecology. And and there's a little tiny in, interesting aspect to, to to add on to that as well, which speaks to the the reframing that's that's picking up pace these days. 
um, which will kind of link in back to the, the key question I want to put to you, um, is that Tree of Heaven is one of these plants like, like walnut and others, which are allelopathic. They, they put ke certain chemicals into the soil that are it, it, through the lens of survival of the fittest and, and the kind of the competitive uh, mindset discourage other plants from growing around them. Now, many of those chemicals are being looked at through a different lens, a more holistic lens. Ilanthone, which is the allelopathic compound with the tree of heaven, happens also to be very potent, a potent anti-malarial chemical. And the tree is used as medicine for anti, anti you know, to, to counter malaria, you know, with humans. So it's really interesting, you know, that the, the and this it ties in with this idea of invasive plants being used to treat invasive disease. But the key question is, how far back, um, I've given a few examples back to the 19th century, but it probably goes slightly further back than that, that artists have kind of picked up on this narrative and, and raised this kind of question. And do you, what's the difference between then and now? Um, do you, it, is it more than just an echo? Is there an amplification happening now, do you think? Hmm. It's a good question. It's interesting. Well, um, the, the examples that you just given, I mean, they, they're really everywhere. I can draw, for example, a parallel with eucalyptus tree that I know of and that I researched in quite in depth. Um, eucalyptus is also considered to be an allelopathic tree to some extent because um, it also causes acidification of the soil because of the tannins, uh, many, many trees, in fact, have tannins. Um, and that's how artists are using plants. They are basically printing with tannins. That's, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, other things as well. But for example, the interesting thing about um, what you just mentioned, what I started thinking about is, I think we get ourselves into trouble when we take things out of context too much. And by bringing plants from um, different countries, which we have done extensively and everywhere, we have put ourselves into big, big trouble because uh, things are very complex in nature and things are incredibly intricately connected. So the moment we take something from somewhere, from a different soil, from a different context and put it elsewhere in a completely different family of trees, we suddenly create a set of issues a set of new relationships but also it comes with a set of challenges that are challenges for the plants that grow uh, in the surrounding of this uh, new plant but also for us uh, that we are also part of this ecosystem but what comes with it and what eucalyptus tree taught me is the overlooked gifts that this plant brings mm. so yes it brings challenges but also it brings gifts uh, in Australia, eucalyptus tree is a sacred tree and it, it's been sacred for I don't know how long and they know this tree really well. It can heal a lot of diseases. It serves shelter. It uh, provides uh, food in specific conditions, even water. Um, ecologically speaking, now they understand in Portugal, for example, this tree can draw water for other plants where water is gone because we destroyed forests, so the water has gone too far deep in because the tree has much longer root, which creates prob problem in monocultures. Now they know that for regenerative projects, for reforestation projects, they can actually use eucalyptus tree temporarily to draw the water for the new plants that will regenerate near. And my observation, my personal observation is the plant actually allows a lot of oaks to grow nearby. So an allelopathic plant or the plant that um, shows allelopathic properties is not necessarily only not allowing the plants to grow nearby. It actually has its own family of plants that will be growing like black walnut, for example, that I researched uh, this year when I was doing a project in Botanical Garden of Lisbon, that is not a plant from here, it's a plant from North America. And it, it does exactly the same. It allows certain plants to grow near it, but other plants don't grow. I think what's shifting now and what's changing is that, um, I think because of this extreme connectivity and of course because of globalization and also because accessibility to knowledge also because 
we're living in a time when, when finally indigenous voices have so much more power and they are so much more outspoken and finally they get the stage. I think we can learn so much and mm -hmm. we can um, use this knowledge very carefully uh, in a way that we connect the dots, we make links, we relink things where there is a disruption land uh, where I go and work has a lot of disruptions in the land. What I'm seeing is the flow of the land is disrupted because we have shifted things far too much. We have um, unearthed too many things and moved too many things around. So what the land is saying is she wants the flow to be restored and we are there to do the work. We are there to help. So I do believe that artists right now in this time that we are living have of course, much more information of all kinds. So it's just a question of going deeper. But I also do believe that um, one of the priorities is really to work with indigenous knowledge, be it the indigenous knowledge that is kind of buried underneath the level of the surface. For example, indigenous Portuguese or indigenous knowledge in Italy or elsewhere, where people in the villages still remember and it's already very difficult because when we ask them questions when we go and research it's um, very difficult they almost um, it's almost not there but sometimes you pull one thread and suddenly uh, the whole uh, tapestry comes to you but mm. of course also working with indigenous knowledge across borders uh, when i started working with eucalyptus the plant itself told me that there will be a moment in the project which is ongoing um, that uh, in, uh, I should connect with Aboriginal people and I should make this link because they also have, will have certain answers to the questions and challenges that trouble us here. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That leads nicely into the next question from Viv. Can you say more, please, about your conversations and meditations with plants? Do you hear them as sound or visual or heart intuitions? That's a beautiful question, Viv. Thank you so much. So, I wasn't planning. <laughs> I wasn't planning to do any of this. Uh, I think it came quite naturally. What happened is I they speak to me through my dreams because I'm very connected to my dream space. Uh, what I, what I understand is that nature uh, and plants specifically will find a way to speak to you um, in the form and shape that you are most. Uh, open and receiving to so for example if you're a visual person if you're an artist that works visually probably it will be through pigments or forms or shapes and colors if you are a son a person who is much more connected with the sonic realm and i know a lot of sonic artists who work in the realm you know with, with basically with plants speaking quite yeah. quite actively i mean electronic signals but also a plant communication as we now understand it how plants communicate between each other and how they also communicate to us so i think it sometimes is images and visions sometimes it's in meditations but also now that i know that they speak to me i also go and learn from the people who share their knowledge how to tune in better how to listen deeper and how to go to the places and make myself available for this kind of listening mm -hmm. so First is through dreams, but then I think we can make it actually quite practical. It's like any meditation. If you master it, then it starts happening more actively, but I can never plan it. So usually uh, when I want uh, some something, it doesn't happen in the moment. It usually happens after a while in a dream or, and I write a lot of poetry. So for me, it's really important that they come into play. They, they come and take that space that I offer them. So I really make an effort to make that space available and make the time as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, from, from my own experience, uh, and I'm, I'm still too new to this kind of communication really, but um, I think plants have been speaking to me. This I do, do, does feel right uh, for me. They've been speaking to me since I was very young. I just didn't realize but i mean one of the few times i've consciously gone to you know to workshop to kind of try this out for myself with an open mind it's been it's been a very powerful experience and for me it, you know we were in one instance that i can recall readily uh invited to kind of notice what words popped into my head or what 
bodily sensations ar uh, arose. And um, I, I had a very clear um, answer to a question I put to a mulberry tree once. So I, I'd, inv I'd invite anyone to have a go if they haven't. Yeah, um, it, it's not complicated, it's quite simple. And uh, you know, there, there are those who would say that not just plants, but all other forms of, of life are communicating all the time to us. We just, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't pick up on it. Um, okay. Um, question from anonymous. Artists often have muses for their art. This kind of follows on quite nicely as well. I often acknowledge my writing is from from the muse because I'm really not as clever as the writing that comes out. Is there a particular weed or plant that is your go-to muse and why? <laughs> well, um, it's a paradoxical situation, but really eucalyptus has become very much of a muse. Mm. I think it's an incredibly complex plant. It's an incredibly uh, problematic um, it's the plant itself is not problematic, but the situation that we ended up yeah. with is incredibly problematic. By the way, the the problem is not just here, but in Galicia, in Spain, in California, um, in China, in India, in actually many places where, and in Australia itself, by the way. So the plant was moved from one specific place where it belongs to another place where it was planted in plantations. So I keep, uh, yes, I keep working with the plant and the journey continues and I take my time with it. But uh, recently, and this is of course unavoidable, the plant that came into my life much stronger and in, in a more kind of uh, demanding attention way is oak tree. Mm. And uh, then I realized that actually I've been connected to oak tree since much longer time than I realized but it came through many different um, ways and dimensions. And recently uh, we made a conversation called the Mighty Oak because I host these monthly conversations on Eternal Forest and I invited a lot of speakers who speak for the oak. So oak is very much present. And of course um, it's an incredibly powerful symbol of, that can symbolize so much for so many people but also because in fact it's um it's a tree or even a family i would say that has been very misunderstood from many different perspectives it's been misunderstood ecologically speaking so because um i will just share a little bit uh, what Please. i found uh, out recently my observations because the tree is believed to be so resilient and so strong we thought that we could do whatever we want with this tree. So, for example, in Portugal, this tree is planted in, um, I don't want to say monocultures, but in kind of agroecological system that is called Montado. Mm -hmm. It's called Dijesa in Spain. And it's basically a um, cork oak tree, or sometimes um, azinera tree. Sorry, I don't remember how it's called in English. Um, this is two types of oaks and then you have uh, animals, you have sometimes forest flowers, but really a lot of people have been since we got our hands on machines, we have been turning the earth and so we've been damaging, uh, we've been extracting a lot of cork, we've been damaging roots a lot. And also uh, we ended up with understanding that these plants, they just can't do without family of other oaks but also other plants. So now what we have already since 30, 40 years is Montado is in very, very high degradation um, stage. And this problem persists everywhere. Everywhere I go and work with communities, everybody is saying that cork oaks and azinyarish are dying. And the tree is, is resilient, but it cannot be by itself. So it's, it's actually quite fragile as, at the same time that it looks so huge and strong and giant and um and of course we have some beautiful examples of oak um oaks from all over europe and uh, what i know is that we used to have uh, about i don't want to make a mistake but about 600 types of oaks from the oak family. And now we can only count, for example, in Portugal, they just did a study 11 types plus 13 hybrids. So 
you can only imagine how much poorer the system, the ecosystem is now and what we can actually do differently. Yeah, I mean, I've, got, I've had some experience of the Montado. It's a, it's a, in its healthy form, it's a, it's a gorgeous landscape. And uh, we're probably both familiar with organizations like Eco Interventions, who are based in Portugal, who do wonderful work regenerating the, the cork oak forests there in their familial assemblage with all the herbs. And they've got a wonderful way of combining um, ecological restoration with regenerative agriculture. And I think on a small island or set of island nations as the British Isles is, I think it's going to become really, really important and it's, it, it, you know, the future. And I think it's interesting, we, you know, a lot of the Southern European species are actively naturalizing in our country now. So before, or for, for a long time, we've had two native species of oak here, um, but we now have, you know, the, the turkey oak and uh, the Mediterranean holm oak that are actively naturalizing. I even, I've even seen really established cork oaks uh, here in North Devon, uh, which is extraordinary. So, you know, back to what you were saying about indigenous knowledge and sharing that, you know, we as a British culture with our traditions and idea, sense of identity, um, will need to look to, to Southern European cultures as the as future generations kind of arrive to see how we need to alter our relationships with our landscape and what it uh, you know how to how to work with its co create with its the, its gifts you know and that just circles me back to something about trauma as well um, yeah you know and again the role of artists how they can work with that because you know britain has a very strong sense of identity and uh, you know a history of of sensitivity around invasion and things like that so i think the role of artists there dealing with that working with that trauma and kind of opening up the discussion and the feelings and processing that would be a really good thing in the future yeah oaks fascinating group of plants in the northern hemisphere i think the center of diversity is in um, currently in in central central america i think there's an awful lot in asia as well a lot of the european oaks as you probably know got wiped out through the ice ages that's why we haven't got so many here along with many other forms of plant okay on to another question um Another from Anonymous. Art from plants also comes in the form of music. Uh, you referred to this. Have you heard of plant music? And is there a, 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 is there a particular musician that you like, a plant, vegetal musician that you like? Vegetable musician. There are so many. And uh, actually, um, so there is one uh, artist I should mention. He's based in UK. He's my friend. I met him in London, uh, Daniel Jones. Uh, please uh, try to find his name, Daniel Jones. Uh, they made a really beautiful project with, in collaboration with another composer. I think it is called Forest Symphony, and I think it was in one of the forests near London, if I'm not mistaken. So I really like that project. I personally hosted an artist called Miley's. It's M-I-L-E-E-C-E. -E and uh, her work she's she's one of the first ones who did plant music specifically so she developed a whole set of little devices that can um read the changes in electromagnetic um spectrum in in plants and uh, she developed music from that so she is herself electronic musician so she also composes music but she also creates music directly from the signals and an interesting thing about her, I met her last year um, when I was traveling in France. Uh, she lives in south of France and she is actually creating her own wild sanctuary in south of France. So um, I highly recommend her work. Um, uh, her work you also can hear on the new podcast we just released with the networking with plants in the Anthropocene. So uh, the little bits of the sound that you hear there as an intro, outro and in between is also her music. Um, yes, I think there is um, a lot of artists who are experimenting with listening to plants, hearing sounds, creating um, plant music. There is a whole new generation of artists. I think it's a fairly uh, kind of 
how to say like a narrow field because this the signals are there and the signals are the same it's just what you do with the signals do you just amplify them do you use the signals to affect your own music your own sounds or what do you basically do um but uh, I also think that plants produce music just by being with the wind. So when mm. in, interesting observation, when you go and stay in specific areas of the forest where you have only pine forest or only eucalyptus or a congregation of specific trees, you will notice that the wind, the quality of the wind and the sound is very different. And I think as humans, as, as species that evolved with the forest in the forest, hunting and going at night through the forest, we have to understand these sounds. Um, I for it's it's like it's like in between tactile and sonic when it starts getting dark and you need to get out of forest and you start noticing all these plants that rub against your clothes and uh, kind of um, there's some recognition there. So for me, the, the the music of the plant is the sound of the landscape that also can be familiar because if we live with places, then it becomes gradually our environment so we understand it better of course mm. do you say something a little bit more of you mentioned the network uh, networking with plants in the anthropocene this is one of uh, a number of emergent networks that are arising around the kind of global networks uh, as fora for these very exciting for me anyway very exciting conversations around kind of reimagining our relationship with plants do you say a little bit more about that Yes, this network uh, got formed after conference last year and um, uh, basically the idea is to look at ethical treatment of plants and how this uh, relationship with plants can change as um, to, to weave artistic narratives, to weave literary narratives, but also weave uh, learning um, settings. So a lot of people who participate in this network are academics and they're also interested in creating learning tools for learning with plants. Um, I guess that the question of plant voice, plant intelligence is also somehow woven into this discussion. So right now the network is becoming active with several members, but also members who are slowly becoming interested. And what we are currently doing is we just released the first um, intro podcast with people who participate more actively so it's introductions from six members i believe but then there will be in the future series of interviews so if you go uh, you can find networking with plants in the anthropocene podcast on soundcloud and i do believe that on spotify as well uh, but we could probably i don't know how to find link right now just try to google and see if you can find yeah. and we are aiming to do once in two months um introductions to uh people's work who work in this area and do a series of interviews but also start creating bridges and connections um internationally to try to create these learning journeys and see how we can um offer them to the communities mm -hmm. thank you um, another one is that we both know about is the plant initiative as well that's another new network um another question here flower pressing has been considered an art form for many years what do you feel about this style of art given the fact that the plant is sacrificed yeah that kind of takes us back to the the plant sentience and beingness, isn't it? And the fact that kind of Jain monks and the resurgence community members will know, obviously, that Satish Kumar uh, used to be a, a Jain monk and, and still kind of adheres to many of those values, I'm sure. Um, but they don't, they will not eat plants where the whole plant is, is as I understand it anyway, is, is kind of sacrificed. So yeah, in, in that kind of art context, how do you feel about that? uh it's a good question because we are talking here about um the approaches so how do you approach this how do you approach a plant and how do you approach a tree and if you want to take if you have this artistic vision artistic idea that perhaps you would like to use um, part of the tree or a plant as a material how do you do it uh, i personally would always ask permission mm -hmm. and i would um I would think twice if it's really the best method to express the idea that I have. I prefer to use plant materials that are readily available. For example, eucalyptus 
just gives uh, plant material it's on the ground i only use um dry leaves and dry bark however sometimes i use green leaves for different purposes mm. the thing is that plants they do want to share and they do want to collaborate with us uh, it's quite possible that if you ask the question uh, let's say you want to use a specific part of the plant like a leaf or a flower what if the plant actually had a message that they could share through your project and what if the plant also got something out of it uh, in the end I, I don't know for me for me working with plants is, and working generally uh, with forest and with nature it's an exchange so my question is uh, is it regenerative mm. uh, is this art regenerative as artists, sometimes we have to use, for example, artificial materials because it can't be avoided. That's another big Pandora box that uh, I don't want to open right now. Uh, but if you're an artist who is, is really focused on using flower, flowers and leaves, then you just have to be really aware what you're taking and also not take too much because we also, uh, we have to remember that flowers they are good for pollinators so we have to leave something for the pollinators so that we also can enjoy more i mean there are actually artists now i i wouldn't remember names but there are actual artists who grow gardens specifically mm -hmm. so they can use plant uh, plants for their artworks whether it's pressed flowers or whether they draw them they paint them they um, they extract um, uh, they extract ink so there are many different approaches i do harvest quite a lot of um, mainly seeds but for different purposes because i use seeds to actually replant trees and replant um, grasses and replant uh, flowers um, because sometimes you arrive to the ecosystem and there is nothing there but also with this i need to be very careful and aware ecologically speaking but also ethically speaking how much I can take and whether it's actually right to move a seed from one specific point to another uh, to another place. Yeah, I, I suppose we're, uh, we're thinking again to last week in the first uh, in this series with Robin Harford, ethnobotanist and, and forager and, and foraging obviously featured strongly in, in last week's event, you know, the equivalent of, a, of a, the code in, in foraging, you know, or what the indigenous cultures know as the, I think, the honorable harvest. It's the, it's the equivalent we're kind of talking about there in terms of our relationship with how we, how we use the plants. But certainly, yes, you know, it's something I, I'd like to um, uh, explore further, whether it's with the resurgence in, in future in, a, in another version of, of, of this kind of webinar series. There's a lot of philosophers like Michael Marder, for example, who are kind of stepping into the breach now to kind of kind of ask the questions. OK, given what we're starting to, to, to realize now about plant sentience, but I mean, not just plant sentience, myco mycological sentience, et cetera, fungal intelligence. Well, where does that leave us? How do we now relate with these other living beings? And, you know, vegans are, are starting to get really concerned. They're like, oh, OK, what, you know, what are we going to be eating? How do we how do we do that? So it's really important that those that narrative gets opened out. So it'd be lovely to kind of kind of do something similar to this in the future, looking at, you know, speaking to people who are, who are starting to kind of tease that out for us uh, and kind of highlight the, the, the steps in front of us and, and which ones we can take. Um, We've got no more questions, and we're, but we're almost coming, coming to the end now anyway. Um, one thing I could throw in just at the end, um, given I've got a horticultural and, and kind of landscape design background, um, naturalistic garden allowing wildflowers to grow in our gardens is, is being um, promoted, particularly in this country, but all around you know, the, the modern societies. Um, for ecological reasons, obviously, but often for aesthetic reasons as well. You know, anyone who's got close up with a, a ragwort flower or willow herb flower or many of the plants that we've spoken about, dandelion, for example, they're gorgeously beautiful when you kind of zoom in. And, you know, there are also many of the popular gardening styles like prairie planting or um, other forms of naturalistic gardening are 
essentially inspired by wildflowers and wild plant communities. And so, you know, that's another kind of arena for this shift in the zeitgeist, which I think is really exciting. Uh, and one interesting fact that perhaps some of the, the audience will know, we, we have the Royal Horticultural Society uh, in, in, in Britain, which is, um, you know, the go-to place for all things horticultural, uh, whose president right at the moment is called Keith Weed, which I think is a wonderful example of what they call apparently an inaptronym. I'm not, I'm not a linguist, but um, it's, it's not the only example of where, you know, the surname being so appropriate for the, for the times we, uh, we live in now. Um, Roxanne is asking... Connection. I love this whole connection with surnames because in Portugal, for example, you will find a lot of people who are called Carvalho, Castanheira, Oliveira. Yeah. Um, they say, so I ask people, why, why do they have last names like this? And they say that um, there is a link to, so they, these are Jewish families that they didn't want to be known uh, in the times uh, when they were persecuted. So yeah. they were taking the, the names, the last names of the trees. So we have a lot of trees here. We actually have, it's really beautiful. I want to do something like a project with this because we have a whole forest of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's one, one question that sneaked in there. Yes, can we repeat the name of the two networks? Correct, one was the plant initiative mm -hmm. and then the other one was networking with plants in the Anthropocene. And we've also got a question, and I think this is Alda from Thunder Bay in Canada. Do you know of Diana Beresford Kruger to speak for the trees? Canadian elder of Celtic training from Europe, uh, has properties she also worked in Southern Ontario. Um, it's kind of partial question there, but yes, do you want to speak to that quickly? Yes, I know of her work, I am aware, and I have a book on my Kindle. Uh, I, it's in my kind of pipeline to, to dive uh, deeper. Uh, but yes, uh, what I wanted to say is Celtic tradition is definitely attractive to me. It's uh, because it's also connected with the roots in Portugal. It's quite present and it's very, very strong. Uh, in the north, when you go to the north, to Porto and around the north of Portugal, they say, no, 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 we are totally different here. We are from the Celtic tradition. Oh, really? So, wow. Yes. Yeah, fascinating. I heard that several times and it's true that the best forests in Portugal are in the north. So uh, somehow there is this sense that people preserved and protected their forests much better in the north than in the south. And the landscape is totally different. But thank you mm -hmm. so much, um, Alda, for this suggestion. It's on my list and definitely I would love to even potentially meet if I go to Canada. <laughs> All right. Yes. Thank you to Alda and thank you to all the um, all the questioners. Thank you very much. And um, we can probably we should probably draw it to a close now. Um, perhaps I'll just briefly end uh, before I do the final thanks uh, with that John Clare poem from the 19th century. And uh, this is taken from his uh, um, piece, The Progress of Rhyme. I might need these. So this is an extract. And weeds that bloomed in summer hours, I thought they should be reckoned flowers. They made a garden free for all, and so loved them great and small, and sung of some that pleased my eye, nor caught, could, nor caught, nor could I pass the thistle by, but paused and thought it could not be a weed in nature's poesy. There we go. So yes, hopefully um, this is not a blip, but uh, an amplification of uh, and an echo of um, messages from the past in terms of our relationships with these, at the end of the day, quite extraordinary plants. Evgenia, thank you so much. That was a brilliant presentation and a, and a wonderful discussion. Thank and you. Uh, it's, been, it's been a real treat to have you on. Uh, and I'm sure our conversations will continue in due course uh, in the future. Thank you also to the audience for participating today, uh, those live and those
who will be coming in on the recording at a later date. Thank you to Resurgence, the Resurgence Centre here in Hartland, North Devon for hosting us and to Mark and Rowena behind the scenes for sorting out the tech and, and other admin roles. And yeah, uh, I'm already looking forward to the final part of this webinar series next week with Professor Chris Thomas, Director of the Leverhulme Centre for Anthropocene Biodiversity based at York University. And we'll be picking up um, on some of the points you, you uh, raised in one of your responses, Evgenia, about Speaking of the gains that these moving plants and plant migrations and, uh, are bringing, not just um, looking at the, the, the perceived uh, uh, losses in that regard. So that should be a fascinating um, discussion uh, from the scientific perspective. Chris is one of the leading um, ecologists and evolutionary biologists, um, certainly in this country, if not the world. So that's going to be great. Thank you and um, take Thank care. You so out. Much. Take care out there in these stormy times. I think the rain is just about eased outside here. But uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you, Evgenia. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.